everybody. Um, we're here today with Dr. Azar Rana and Sandra Kuto of Integrated Med Health Communications. And um, just to start off, let's let's hear a little bit about yourselves and uh, what Integrated Med Health Com, Com does. Sandra, why don't you start ladies first? <laughs> Wonderful. So hi, uh, Steve. Thanks so much for having us. My name is Sandra Kuto. I am a licensed uh, pharmacist uh, and currently the uh, head of medical and scientific affairs at IMC. Uh, IMC is uh, a medical health education and communications agency. We work with uh, clients all over the all over the globe, uh, pharmaceutical and uh, cannabis as well. Um, and I've been very interested in the medical cannabis arena, not only as a healthcare professional, but also as a medical cannabis patient myself. I suffer with uh, rheumatoid arthritis and have been using medical cannabis. So uh, really excited to be a part of uh, our discussion uh, today. Thanks for having us. Excellent. And uh, my name is Azur Rana. Uh, thanks again uh, for having us as well. Um, so I'm the president at IMC North America. Um, our, as Sandra mentioned, we, we're a full-service medical communications agency. Uh, we have offices in Toronto and Boston for our North American affiliate and uh, offices in Cairo, London, uh, and Cambridge for our uh, UK and global offices. Uh, most of the work we do is, as Sandra mentioned, with the, the pharmaceutical and the cannabis world. Um, our role is to be the experts in communicating the science and the data that needs to go out to healthcare professionals, policy advisors, patients, uh, and other stakeholders within the environment. Gotcha, gotcha. And so, um, let's let's jump into this. So, um, the rates of prescriptions um, coming from doctors seems to not be where um, a lot of folks wanted it to be, especially, I guess, during the heyday of. Uh, um, this whole industry when it was hyped up a lot. Um, can one of you tell me a little bit about why doctors are hesitant to prescribe? Well, I could, I could start with that. Yeah. Um, well, the, the physician um, industry, if you will, um, there's, there's always been skepticism about medical cannabis and the, and the value of medical cannabis. Um, and I think a part of that is, is obviously driven by the, um, like the lack of, solid evidence that has been generated over years. And, and we all know why um, cannabis hasn't really been studied for many years, and, and now it's starting. Right. To um, so I think for physicians specifically, uh, the challenge has been, you know, how do you reconcile, one, uh, a product that was illegal? How do you start transferring your thought process to, to be prescribing that for your patients? Um, and the second is obviously the stigma associated with cannabis, right? It's It's the, the, the people who have studied it and who understand it can see the, the therapeutic value for it. Um, but the, the general average physician who hasn't spent a lot of time with medical cannabis uh, probably still sees it as, you know, something that people will smoke um, and uh, use as a recreational drug rather than a medical treatment. And if I could just add to that, <clears throat> in all fairness to the uh, medical community who's looking for scientific evidence, as with any new drug that comes onto the market, I think that uh, they were uh, hoping for and, and rightfully asking for some of this data <clears throat> to, uh, to be available to them when they're uh, trying to prescribe. And unfortunately, because of the way the industry has evolved and also because uh, cannabis itself is a generic plant and hasn't been patented, uh, the, the level of rigor and the clinical studies that are required for a molecule like that is not similar. We can't apply the same model, if you will, that in the pharmaceutical industry uh, exists. And so there's been a bit of a catch up. So while physicians are asking for data that should be available, the industry, the cannabis industry is just catching up in terms of doing the clinical work in order to make uh, the scientific evidence available for these prescribers and for patients and for for uh, for payers as well. So we're moving in the right direction, but we're not there yet. Gotcha. And so communicating uh, this information to doctors, among other stakeholders, is something that IMC is involved with, right? That's correct, yeah. And so you guys have an interesting viewpoint on what's out there. Can you talk a little bit about the research that's happening? And um, perhaps with your global view, tell us a little bit about which which countries are doing, are, are doing a lot of work here, maybe even the companies. Um, yeah, if you guys can comment on that, that'd be really interesting. Sure, I, I can jump uh, 
take that one. Uh, and then Azur, maybe you can comment on some of the work we're doing globally. But in Canada, IMC has been supporting uh, some great uh, novel work in the collection of data from uh, patients who are using medical cannabis, specifically with respect to um, validated strains of medical cannabis. So right now, the industry, there are no standards for uh, licensed producers when it comes to making their cannabis products. Uh, we know that there's a lot of substitution that happens. We know that <clears throat> patients will often start with, let's say, one cannabis product, find effectiveness, and then you know three months later, they, they order the same product, but they're not necessarily getting the same efficacy or results that they they had three months ago. And that's because there there are some substitutions that are happening when licensed producers are making uh, their products. Um, and so for the first time, uh, we uh, in Canada are actually studying the um, what we're calling validated strains. So licensed producers have rallied together and have committed to uh, providing full transparency of their of their strains with respect to the cannabinoid profile, the terpene profile, and the DNA makeup of that plant. And so now for the first time, we can actually start collecting outcome data for patients that are taking these strains and um, measuring uh, their effectiveness. And so IMC has been instrumental in supporting the study development from protocol synthesis to uh, data collection tools, uh, working with academic, uh, the academic site, um, as well as physicians across Ontario. Oh, sorry, Canada, not Ontario. All across Canada. All <laughs> I was looking at a map of the globe and I said Ontario, sorry. <laughs> To your, to your other question uh, about um, what else is happening around the world and where, where's the data being generated, it's, it's very, you know, I think we're all very proud of the fact that Canada is definitely at the top of that list of, of leading research and oh, that's uh, cool to hear. within the space. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic that, you know, it's something that we're investing in, something that we're looking to study and actually understand rather than, um, you know, unfortunately what we're seeing south of the border where, cannabis research or medical cannabis research is, is very stifled because of uh, the Controlled Drug Substance Acts and the, the issues that they're facing both at a federal and uh, state level within the U.S. But so Canada is one of them, uh, which we're doing, we're doing great work. Um, Israel is another country uh, that is very uh, invested in understanding cannabinoids and terpenoids um, and making sure that patients who need the treatments are getting the, the right things in the, in the right concentrations. Um, unsurprisingly, the Netherlands, uh, who have been one of the pioneers right. of, uh, of cannabis for, for years, there's a lot of research that happens um, both at a national as well as a local level within the, the Netherlands. And I think the other country, um, well, there's European countries that are starting to pull research together, right? So we know that Germany is um, is leading the charge in Europe. The UK is starting to come on board and uh, allowing for some sort of studies on uh, what happens specifically in the epilepsy space. Um, and then one other on the list, which uh, which is surprising for me, was the Czech Republic. They're, they're really doing a lot of... Oh, interesting. Yeah, they're doing a lot of really great work uh, at a number of centers within the Czech Republic that are, that are dedicated to cannabinoid research. So, yeah, fascinating stuff. Any particular studies um, that, are, that have come up that are interesting to you guys or surprising? Well, one that I would say is interesting is the one that we're doing. Um, yeah, awesome. Yeah. Um, and, and not to uh, jokes apart, I think the, the study that we're um, working on right now um, is really, uh, it's, you know, one of its kind. It's, it's a study where we're, you know, there's patients coming in, they're getting validated products. We're, we're assessing the response to cannabinoids um, based on, validated questionnaires on different disease states uh, and really understanding it from a patient perspective, what happens to you as an individual when you're using medical cannabis and with the validated strains that Sandra mentioned, we're able to go back and then understand how those strains have affected different people. So I think this is one of the, the first ones that is, is that um, intensive in terms of the data that we're, we're hoping to get out. Um, Sandra, any other ones that you want to mention? Uh, not at this point, but I do want to say that what's exciting uh, is that we now have 
consensus uh, and agreement from the licensed producers in Canada, which is really, really exciting. Uh, we didn't have that in place before. And so now we're creating uh, the structure, if you will, or the framework for licensed producers to, uh, to work within and to provide that transparency, which I think they didn't have before. And so now um, that's really shaping the Canadian marketplace. We're going to learn a lot from this particular study in terms of uh, the importance of validation as well as the importance of um, uh, uh, having um, transparency from seed to sale. Uh, we, we all talk about it, but uh, now we actually have the data to showcase for it uh, all the way to patient reported outcomes. So I think, you know, to your earlier question, Steve, about uh, what physicians are asking for and that they don't have available to it, it we, we still will have some of that information that will certainly help them prescribe more confidently for their patients. Yeah, if I may just add one other Please. thing. Um, from a, just from a research perspective, like we know there's companies um, and, and partners that we're working with as well uh, who are doing you know, bench and scientific research on the use of THC, CBD and other cannabinoids uh, within the product. Um, and those, those studies are going to be vital for uh, decision making for physicians in the future as we get more and more uh, options in terms of uh, delivery methods for cannabinoids, right? So whether we're looking at oils, whether we're looking at sprays or gels or topicals or whatever the, the formulations that are coming in, there's a lot of innovation there. Um, those will be focused on those product delivery. But one of the things that we're seeing within the market that there is still a lot of people who, who like their oils and like their flour. So for them and for those people to have validation of what they're doing and for their physicians also to have validation of their treatment plans, I think some of these real-world studies um, are going to be very important uh, as we go forward. Yeah, that's excellent. And I want to touch on that in one sec. But one question I want to get in before that yeah. is um, for, for medical patients right now and, and for doctors right now, um, if somebody um, or, yeah, if a patient's coming in presenting with a certain in indication um, uh, or the patients themselves are looking for strains, how are they going about um, choosing the right strain for them right now? Is, is that really possible or is that more of a trial and error thing right now? Go ahead, Sandra. <laughs> this, is a, this is a topic we've debated many times. So like, <laughs> That's a great question. And I think that um, there's a lot of ways of answering uh, answering your question, Steve. I think from a patient perspective, uh, there is no one place for patients to go to. They uh, will rely on their healthcare professionals. And uh, if their healthcare professional is open to and comfortable with prescribing medical cannabis, then, then they can certainly uh, have that discussion. Uh, we know, however, that there's a number of them that aren't. And so cannabis clinics have started to pop up, uh, at least in Canada, and that they have been uh, instrumental in helping uh, patients get access as well as information about the strains that are available. And those are usually led by healthcare professionals. So in terms of um, at least accessing the information, patients do have that as options. They can obviously self uh, self-learn and self-educate. But then when it comes to picking the strains uh, and matching it to their ailment and their symptoms, um, that is a little bit of a trial and error. We know that, uh, you know, there's variations between um, individuals when it comes to metabolizing cannabis. So uh, a dose that works well for you may not work well for me and vice versa. And so uh, having, you know, somebody say, well, try this strain at this dose, uh, that may not be enough for patients. And so patients will often have to go through a number of different uh, options or, or trials before they can actually get to the, the strain that works. And that's why that study that we were talking about is going to be so critical for them because they will then be able to find that right strain and know for certainty when they buy it that that particular strain now with transparency, they know exactly what's in the bottle, what they're paying for will give them the effect that they've they've been experiencing. So, um, you know, I think it's a bit of a trial and error and also for physicians as well in terms of the robustness of the data, there is a lot of data that's been generated over the, the last few years on medical cannabis. No, no discounting that. But in terms of the repository where all that information resides, I think it's a bit fragmented right now. 
and so uh, trying to consolidate and have that available easily for physicians is something that's sort of emerging. We, we have been working very closely with organizations, educational organizations within Canada to put forward accredited programs for physicians to access and that continues. Um, but in terms of like a quick and easy fix, that there isn't anything like that right now. Azur, right. do you add anything more? Yeah, there, there's, um, I think you've covered 90% of it. Um, there's a couple of da uh, large data collection tools that we know are in the market um, that are collecting data from patients and individual patients. Um, what, we're, what we don't have right now, I think, is a way to um, ply through that data entirely and, and to come up with all of the questions or the answers to the questions that we have. Um, so I think, there's, there, as Andrew said, there's data that's, being collected. There's the, the trials that we've discussed. There's the apps and the programs uh, that anybody can download and uh, collect their information. It's just how do we pull that together to make sure that we're getting the information we need to put both the stigma to rest, but also physicians and patients' minds at rest that this is something that's valuable for them. This podcast is brought to you by Grower IQ, a compliant cannabis seed to sale and cultivation management platform. The first platform to integrate all facility systems like sensors, controls, QMS, and ERP, all into a single interface. Grower IQ changes the way cultivators use software, transforming a regulatory requirement into a platform to learn, analyze, and improve performance. Uh, that's really interesting. So it sounds like, um, you know, we have the data out there. It's just almost a matter of time, um, really, before we go through and really mine and understand what those results mean, uh, what that data means for patients. Um, and it also sounded like there's an element of personal medicine there. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And um, when do you see, so I'm going to ask a few forecasting questions here. When, when do you see... Um, I have seen some companies out there that are doing um, genetic testing, sort of the 23andMe as it relates to cannabinoids in folks. Yeah. Um, so that's really interesting. When do you foresee um, that intersection really being fruitful for people? Um, you know, personalized medicine in the mainstream is starting to come online or, or being talked about way more. Um, when do you see that intersecting with the understanding of cannabinoids really um, and um, um, – you know, providing better outcomes for patients. Yeah, I think we're. That's a great question. I think we're we're on track with that right now um, with this program across Canada to have the validation of strains. Um, what patients will get from that is th they'll have clarity on what what is the the cannabinoid profile, but also what is the terpene or terpenoid profile for the product that they're taking. So what that'll give patients the option and the ability to do is whether it's through trial and error or whether there are uh, other future genetic tests coming or not, um, at least having that profile of your cannabis gives the patient the ability to choose exactly what works for them for right. different situations. So like I, I, I know people who will use a certain strain if they're feeling anxious and they'll use a certain strain if they, uh, when they need to sleep. And so being able to, to generate that information for yourself um, by providing patients with that, profile and the exact uh, ingredients, if you will, of what your cannabis is, that I think is the, the biggest step forward that we're taking right now. Awesome. Yeah. So that's really interesting. Um, and so with the validated strains, I think that's, um, I mean, that's an excellent step. Um, but for a lot of pharmaceutical products, when we're talking about a molecule, quite often, yeah, it's just one molecule. But in, in the plant, we have this entourage effect where there's a bunch of different molecules interacting and we don't completely understand what the interactions are or, or what interacts with what to give what uh, effect. Um, and in a plant, it's almost... Uh, a roll of the dice to see what comes out. And I understand people are getting consistency. Um, but um, um, do you see an evolution in the sourcing of the molecules away from the plant? You know, one, one um, analogy I often give is that, you know, we don't, for a headache, we don't chew willow bark anymore because it has inherent problems in the production, etc. Um, well, I do. I don't know about you, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> um, but wait, do you see that evolution coming, or or or, or even necessary for um, cannabis as a medicine? Well, it's a great question, and um, I think we shouldn't forget that we do actually have uh, cannabis products, synthetic 
cannabis products that are on the market that have been on the market for a very long time uh, that have uh, NOCs and have been approved by Health Canada. Uh, so in terms of of uh, synthesizing those molecules, I, I think that there is a uh, a need and an interest and uh, certainly a marketplace for that. Uh, so there are a number of licensed producers right now that are involved in uh, developing synthetic uh, cannabis-based products, uh, that the, and they are putting those t- into clinical trials just like they would, uh, you know, a, a pharmaceutical product. But I, I think we just need to be mindful of the end user and what they're using the cannabis products for. So we exactly. know that when p- patients inhale, for example, the um, uh, they, they will get the entourage effect uh, from the terpenes and the cannabinoids uh, through the, the, the inhaled route. Whereas when you're taking an oil-based product, uh, you're really just getting the, the pure THC, CBD, or whatever the cannabinoid is in that uh, right. oil. So it, it's really going to be dependent on what patients in the end uh, choose and want to, to use the cannabis products for. So I don't think there's a lack of opportunity or a need for these molecules, these synthetic derivatives. Uh, it's just the, the market is big enough to have them. It, it really is going to depend on who's who's buying them and for what purpose. Yeah, and we're, we're already seeing um, conflicting data coming out, right? So there's, there's some studies. I read uh, a paper last week, I think, that said uh, that terpenes don't have an effect, and um, oh, interesting. Use of terpenes will not add. There's no such thing as an entourage effect, and the terpenes won't do anything for a patient. It's the THC and other cannabinoids. And then uh, a paper that um, that we were that you shared with us today that um, describes you know the the definite benefits of terpenoids. So we're, we're getting into the stage now where there's going to be different types of molecules and formulations produced. Some probably. On on one side of the fence, without having the entourage effect or terpenes, and then on the other side effect, on the other side of the fence with terpenes and terpenes. So it's going to be, as Andrew said, it's going to be what the end user needs it for. Like I'll give one analogy: a, a child suffering with Lennox Gastaut syndrome who has multiple seizures on a day, if they're being controlled with THC or, or a combination of THC and CBD, for example, then. For them, terpenes and the entourage effect will have little or no value. But for other people where, you know, they're using cannabinoids or you're inhaling cannabinoids, as we talked about, um, where terpenes can have an effect or do have an effect subjectively for those patients, then those people are going to be more um, likely to purchase the, that, that sort of a formulation. So the market has space for both, I think. All right, yeah. So I was asking... Um Smoking is probably one of the worst ways to get this this medicine, these molecules into your body. I don't know if there's any other analog out there where we um, get patients to smoke something to get, get it in their bodies. No. Um, how far away is the industry from having something that we recognize as a true prescription pharmaceutical? You know, something that's dinnable, um, that has a dr- drug identification number, um, easily paid for by insurance, et cetera, um, that we get from the pharmacy, you know, like a Lipitor or, or what have you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of products that are in development. Um, and, so we, and we know that there are already, as, as Sandra mentioned before, there are some synthetic uh, cannabinoid molecules which are available uh, as dinned products um, or prescription-only products. Um, I think the, the future development of uh, dis- or distribution methods of cannabis, um, whether it's um, going to be through the lungs, will move away eventually from the smoking. I think we've already, we've seen a lot of challenges um, right. with the uh, the vape products, for example, and you know all of the contaminants that were in vape products and, and people struggling with that. But I think the inhalation market, unfortunately, is still going to be a, a big player within the cannabis space for, for many years. I don't think those products are ever going to get a DIN. Um, as you said, there's, there's probably limited analogs of inhalation other than inhalers, but that's right. a, a totally different uh, space. But there are companies that are developing DIN products as we speak. Like some of our partners that we're working with are developing topical products and oral products that will have a DIN eventually, will be pharmaceutical products that are that are prescribed. So time's good, maybe, maybe three or four years probably that we're, we're away from it. 
and just to add to that, in fairness, I mean, the smokable form of cannabis has been a- around and available for centuries, right? Right. So I think that as we start to evolve the industry uh, and the partners and the investment in true clinical development, we will see uh, great products uh, that will slowly replace the inhaled uh, formats. But to Azur's point, it does remain the the biggest player in the market in, in terms of usage. We, we know that there is a lot more patients out there that are using the inhaled route simply because of the fast onset. And until you know we can catch up with the clinical development and start making other products available in the same sort of ingredients, but in different formats, whether they are through inhalers or uh, through some other form that gives a quick onset of action, um, uh, you know, but we are, we are getting there. We just, we have to give uh, these companies time to do the clinical development work. Gotcha. Um, so we talked a lot about the, the doctors um, earlier, um, but Sandra, when we talked earlier, we talked a little bit about pharmacists and how they're mm-hmm. not really being tapped that much for, um, you know, what they can provide patients. Um and so for any any MMJ patients out there, um, I want to ask you, what are things that you can talk to your pharmacist about uh, in terms of um, uh, treating yourself with uh, medical marijuana? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and I'm a little biased here, but uh, I, I do think that pharmacists are probably the the best uh, positioned healthcare professionals out there right now to help support medical cannabis patients for a number of reasons. One is uh, they still remain the most trusted healthcare professional for patients to contact, whether it's through the retail setting or uh, through, uh, you know, hospital affiliations. Uh, But a pharmacist also have uh, extensive training on drug interactions. And so um, quickly understanding how cannabis is metabolized and then looking at your profile of medications, a pharmacist can really help you hone in on uh, the dosings that you need that are appropriate. So if you're taking certain types of medications that metabolize or affect the metabolism of cannabis, then you're likely to see less of an effect. And so you'll, you'll need to up your dose of cannabis or, you know, vice versa. If something is inhibiting the metabolism of cannabis, you'll have much more of that in your bloodstream. And so you may not want to start off with a very high dose. So from a, a drug interaction and also from from a dosing perspective, pharmacists are very well versed in, in that domain. Uh, unfortunately, though, uh, in terms of educating pharmacists and bringing them into the circle of care, uh, we have seen a lot of fragmentation and variation across the country. So some chains of, of pharmacies will, will support their pharmacists and provide a lot of education. Others uh, will not. Uh, the independent pharmacies will end up doing their own programs. So it's a bit of a mixed bag. And uh, we do end up leaving the patients Uh, alone and sort of unsupported and they have to go either to those cannabis clinics or to a call center or or somewhere where they're not necessarily speaking to a representative or a healthcare professional that has full transparency of all the products that they're on and their comorbidities. So um, I'm still waiting for the day where we can actually bring medical cannabis into the pharmacy setting where it rightfully should be and uh, part of uh, standard of care uh, that uh, uh, pharmacists are providing to patients. Right. And presumably um, pharmacists are a group of stakeholders that IMC um, can and or does work with. Is that right? Yeah, we work with pharmacists quite a bit uh, across different disease areas um, and also across different uh, types of projects and activities. So everything from training, um, communication, education, uh, as well as getting uh, advice and input uh, from pharmacists through advisory boards. Um, We we have engaged with pharmacists quite a bit. Interesting. Um, So, Sandra, just a a little bit more about that. Do we... we, um, I'm sure there's more work that needs to be done, but do we fully understand, um, or not fully understand, do we have a beginning on the understanding of what interactions are possible out there with these cannabinoids? I mean, it sounds like we don't understand completely the cannabinoids that we do know. There's a bunch of cannabinoids we don't know about. Um, 
where are we at with in terms of the interactions? Um, like, is is this another grapefruit? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we're peeling it. Yes, we are. There's lots of huh. to it, and I don't know if we could use the analogy of peeling the grapefruit or the onion, but um, certainly from a from the cannabis plant itself, we know there's hundreds of cannabinoids and terpenes. And so we've only just started to scratch the surface with CBD and THC, but there's lots of others. And and having a full repository of drug interactions, to my knowledge, I, I know that many pharmacy uh, software programs have started to incorporate cannabis into their dispensing system. So there is a way of tracking. But again, until we have transparency of what patients are taking in their bottles and in their products at home, there's really no way that we can start isolating uh, CBDA or G or all of the different cannabinoids and how they interact with a product. If we don't know what's in the bottle, we can't measure it. And so we only speak loosely around the you know the, the the class of CBD or the class of THC or the class of the terpenes, and that's why that I mean, he come back to that study. But that study that we're doing right now is is very very you know important and will will inform us on a lot of interesting um, areas that we can build on. So. To your point, I, I think we're we're documenting them. Lots of programs have been uh, updated to include cannabis in terms of drug interactions, uh, but um, we still have a long way ways away. Gotcha. Um, so you mentioned some of the different cannabinoids out there, and you guys are consuming a lot of studies and 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 understand or uh, know what's um, being researched out there. Um, do you guys have a, an idea of what? So CBD in the last year, maybe a bit more, has sort of become the new black. It's it's in everything out there. Um, do you think what molecule, which cannabinoid do you think um, is the next CBD? Uh, in terms of the research out there and its efficacy in treating, you know, a, a myriad of things, if if any. Well, there's been uh, some data that's talked about CBG uh, and its um, antibacterial properties. So um, there's been some speculation, I think, in the in the literature about whether CBG can be used to treat, you know, the superbugs and the super infections that we see in hospitals. Oh, that's interesting. So that that's one I know of for sure that's being uh, that's being studied. Um, I can't really think of any other ones. Uh, Sandra, any other ones that come to mind for you? Um, well, I, I know a lot of them, but I don't know in terms of what they're all yeah. being used for. So I think we're just mapping those out right now. Um, the the interesting thing is in the study that's currently being done to validate the various cannabinoids, they've picked the five most common ones. Now, I can't remember which ones those are. I'd have to go back just quickly to the notes, but um, the top five have actually been identified to be uh, recognized in the study. Uh, so, um, I think we've got THC, CBD, CBN, CBD, and yeah. grapes by mind. Right, right. Interesting. And does, does that include the acid forms or just those? Um, um... Oh, now you're getting all pharmacological. Oh, yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> so we, oh, we can leave that one. So a couple of quick, uh, questions just to, to, uh, to wrap up here. Um, how has your guys' business or, or your, um, your day-to-day, how has it been affected by COVID? Oh wow! Yeah, okay. yeah. Take that one. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, so we we've actually been shut down. Our offices have been shut down since March sixteenth. Um, right. Been working at home now, so it's been what is that? Um, five months now. We've been at home. Mm-hmm. Five. Months we've been at home. Um, so from a business perspective, it's been tough on the team because everybody's been isolated. We're very. Uh, Obviously, with the work that we do, we're very, it's a very social sort of interaction. And there's, you know, right. you clients and you work with clients and you work with the team internally as well. Um, but our team is absolutely the best group of people um, you could ever imagine working with. And they've adapted so fantastically to this uh, adversity over the last few months. Um, so people are good. We're at home, we're working, and our business has actually pivoted quite a bit from like the live interactions and the live engagements to everything virtual. Uh, So all of the conferences, all of the uh, meetings and events, all of the scientific engagement, working with physicians and 
other healthcare professionals. We've moved everything online. So um, thank God and touch wood, our, our business hasn't suffered um, and we're, we're running strong to continue uh, communicating science. Oh, that's- if I can just add to that, um, we, we do have uh, in-house capabilities to do a lot of market research and insights. And so we have been working with pharmaceutical companies and licensed producers to help them address this whole pivot, uh, you know, with uh, virtual health care and virtually seeing your patients and what patients are going through uh, because they're virtually at home and can't connect with their health care providers. So uh, we, we've been doing a lot of work uh, with our companies and our clients to really start to map that out and help them because, uh, you know, care has to continue and research right. and development has to continue and products need to come to the market. Um, and so if there are companies out there that are looking for that expertise, we certainly have that at our fingertips and in-house we can certainly support. Right. And I'm sure those of us in the industry cannot wait for this research to, to, um, to, um, prove out and uh, any delay would be would be not amazing mm-hmm. um, you guys mentioned the conferences and stuff is there um, for the for the listeners out there are there any conferences or, or um, speaking engagements that um, we can look forward to seeing IMC at well we're, we, we are working uh, on a number of opportunities to speak um, on the cannabis space we're looking at a number of opportunities to speak in the US as well as Europe mm-hmm. um, so there are there's small conferences. Some of the bigger ones, I think, that we were used to and we're looking forward to are on pause, I think, both right. from a funding perspective as well as uh, um, just availability of people perspective. Uh, but there are some opportunities that are coming up in, in Europe and the U.S. and happy to, happy to share those with you as soon as those get solidified. Yeah, they, uh, we, we do post those on our website as well. So if uh, the listeners out there want to visit us on our website, that would be uh, a, a great place to start. And what is the website? And LinkedIn. And LinkedIn. Yeah. And LinkedIn. What is the website? Uh, the website is imcmedcom-na.com. Okay, awesome. Um, well, guys, thank you so much. The The interview just flew by there, and I have a lot more questions for you, but <laughs> we got to stop at some point. Um, thanks again, everybody, and, um, yeah, I really appreciated the time spent. Thank you very much for having us. Great, great conversation. Thank you for the opportunity, Steve. Absolutely. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.